Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending what parts of the country you hail from today. Uh, I have a few disclosures and there's some legalese on behalf of Oris. All of us are very knowledgeable on the epidemic of lung cancer in this country and historically really the only options were transthoracic biopsies for better part of almost a decade. Um, many of us uh, listening today have tried different types of EMB strategies. And as these EMB strategies evolved, our goal was to achieve a diagnostic yield that was similar to transthoracic needle biopsy. But despite the iterations of these technologies, we just haven't been able to do that. Even at times when we were taught that if we found a string sign or a bronchus sign, we'd be much more apt to biopsy and expect a higher yield, but that has been a challenge to date. Well, endoscopy is changing today. The goal is very similar to other technologies. We want to get the physician on point of interest, biopsying the nodule, biopsying the mass, being able to deliver an intervention. This technology is not just another reiteration of having to stand there and try to hold a scope in place while you're doing an intervention. Monarch has created a complete different user interface. This allows you to focus on driving to the target of concern, and then you can park the scope. You don't have to hold this. You don't have to uh, be uh, sort of sl enslaved into the bronchoscope. You can actually step aside, leave the scope, and then focus on performing your intervention. This controller has every user interface that you need, being able to move the scope, apply fluids, apply suction, as well as apply uh, sort of futuristic interfaces. So in order to accomplish this, it wasn't just merely designing a different type of catheter or sheet that would go into a traditional uh, endoscope, but there was a complete reinvention of the scope. The scope is actually a collection of two steerable components. There's a sheath as well as a camera. That camera has a 4.4 millimeter outside diameter. Together, these two separate steerable catheters can deliver almost 310 degrees of articulation. At the tip of the camera is sort of the complex array, which includes the continuous navigational guidance sensors, the integrated camera, the LEDs, and a 2.1 working channel, which, can, which is important because I found it allows you to utilize any type of instrumentation that you prefer. Of course, I, I favor using some of the Monarch technology, but I also use some of the other technologies that we have laying around our bronchoscopy suite. When you first start utilizing this technology, it actually comes out as a single paired mode. So at first you're steering both the camera as well as the sheath. And then once you engage into sort of the subsegmental bronchi, then you can park the sheath as we call it, and then utilize the scope under a complete separate guidance system. What's very crucial with any EMB platform is sort of the level of accuracy of the navigational guidance. And one of the points that I value with the Monarch system is in addition to the electromagnetic navigation, this is the only technology that utilizes an optical pattern recognition. It's actually looking at each of the cruxes, as each of the subdivisions as you go forward and drive the scope out. And in doing so, the technology is actually continuously re-registering at every point of the carina, which further improves the level of accuracy of, of your electromagnetic navigation to get you onto the target of concern. I've been involved in EMP now for almost a decade, nine years of my career was really focused on super dimension. I think this was a, a great technology. And we were convinced when this came out that as long as we were able to sort of target the green ball, or if you use a different technology, a different color target, well, then we should be there and we should be able to achieve a high level of accuracy 
of obtaining tissue. Um, I've had, uh, I was blessed to have a very uh, busy practice uh, in this technology. And in the last year, I've moved on to the Monarch system. Many of you who do EMV today on various cross platforms are going to run into challenges. And as I run through these, these were things that I found that I had to adjust to make the technology work better in the patient. All of us are very common of what I refer to as medical grade uh, twister, the EMV version. You know, the traditional EMV utilizes a catheter based system with some kind of electromagnetic locatable guide to put you on a virtual target. And once you're on the target, depending on the configuration you put your body into to get that catheter into said location, you've got to sit there for the entire conduct of the procedure. Any small deviation, you look over your shoulder to see how the specimen is being processed, and suddenly any translation of your hand may result in a significant change, and you're going to move where you're at, and suddenly you've come off of target. You don't have that with the Monarch platform. You can stand, you can sit. The entire ergonomics are very user-friendly. And once you have locked onto your target and you confirm that target, you actually can park the robot by pushing that little green circular button on the uh, control station. And then you are free to do whatever type of intervention you wish to. And as you can see here, and as I will continue to illustrate, not only do you have the confirmation of a robust navigational guidance to get you onto the point of concern, but you have continuous vision through the entire course of doing your biopsy or your intervention. I think this is crucial. All of us have been able to engage these virtual targets and the presumption being if you're on the target, you remove your location guide. Now, blindly, but under this virtual guidance, you should be able to pass in your various different instruments and you should be able to get 100% accuracy in establishing some form of diagnosis. But what I found for the very first time as I moved on to the Monarch platform is at times when we're in the periphery or in the central lung, you can actually see these nodules. You can see them in the, in the spongy parenchyma and you can see your instrumentation going into the nodule and you can control sampling multiple different quadrants of the nodular mass. But more importantly, what we've all come to recognize is many of these peripheral nodules aren't just floating in space. They're actually parallel or perpendicular to very small, easily distendable airways. And so I think this illustrates the point when we would have a patient with a so-called bronchial sign and you engage the target by an EMV platform and you take all your biopsies and then you get a return of benign bronchial tissue or non-diagnostic. You're like, how can that be? I was there, I was on top of the ball. But what you see here is many of these small nodules are gonna to be to the side. So once you recognize that under direct vision, you can navigate, penetrate that airway. I routinely will use a radial endobronchial ultrasound to confirm my location as well as assess the depth of penetration and then multiple biopsies. And then I can actually shift over real time under a couple millimeters, re-penetrate, get into a different zone of that nodule or target of concern and take additional biopsies. And it's quite amazing how many of these nodules that we took for granted that we should be able to biopsy are actually lurking behind these little tiny airways. You can't see that unless you have continuous vision through the entire process of this procedure. When I perform standard EMV, in order to try to achieve targets in different areas, we used very uh, pre-bent, pre-contoured catheters. And with enough of the um, wiggling, we could get onto target. But then the concern was we would pass these regular types of biopsy instruments, brushes, needles, forcep biopsies. And in, unfortunately, we developed catheter deformation. So there you are again. I'm on my virtual target. I know I'm there. I may or may not have a bronchial sign. I've taken 10, 20 biopsies 
and I'm getting normal lung parenchyma or benign bronchial tissue. And there's a real component of deformation that occurs with these pliable catheter systems. That's not the case with the Monarch platform. Once we engage onto the target and we park the robot, it doesn't go anywhere. It's right there. I can deploy a various armamentarium of instruments, any instrument I choose to use. I have direct vision, or in this case, a lesion that I have to penetrate through the airway to get into the area of concern to take all the biopsies. No deformation with this system. This was a sort of a frustrating process. Uh, for some reason, it happened quite often to me. Many of you may have not seen this, but when we bring the, we finally lock onto our target and we bring the fluorone place and there was this artificial interference pattern despite electromagnetically mapping all our rooms and I would create a virtual deviation. My target could move anywhere up to 15 millimeters from where I thought it was. Now, the challenge is I know that my target isn't really moving, my catheter really isn't moving, but because I have no direct vision, I have no idea where I'm at at this point. So it was just a frustrating reproducible issue. We don't see this with the Monarch platform. When I bring in the fluoroscope, if I choose to use it on certain areas of biopsies, there is no change to my screen. Plus I have direct visualization, which confirms I know exactly where I'm at at all times of the biopsy. One of the biggest challenges that we all have is getting those apical lesions, getting those superior segmental lesions, getting the medial apical lesions. And for years, I began to engage these with these extremely pre-contoured medial 190 degree catheters. And yes, again, with enough manipulation to scope, I can engage these targets. But then as I passed my instrumentation through there, I had deviation. And the other challenge I found was that the warmth of the body also causes catheter deviation. So when I'm done with the procedure, even though I may have started with a medial catheter, once I pull the catheter out, it looks almost like a 90 degree catheter. There is no issue with approaching apical or medial apical targets. The lesion on the right is a nine millimeter lesion in the medial left upper lobe adjacent to the aortic knob. I can deliver this catheter anywhere I wish into the lung with complete control as well as optical recognition. Now, in the technology that I previously utilized, we had to pay a fee to have all the rooms of concern that we utilized the uh, system in electronically mapped. And if something changed, if new electrical hardware was brought into that room, we had to remap the room once again. So because I also use this in conjunction with DaVinci Robotics, I would have to map one of my robot rooms. That is not the case with the Monarch platform. You can wheel this robot into any room and automatically utilize it. The value I have here is when I do combined procedures, I can use any one of the four robot rooms we have available. I can use this in our Bronx suite. My colleague will use it in the Bronx suite, and we can easily move this mobile device anywhere we want. If you look at it, the device has two arms, but it does have the capacity immediately to receive a third arm. So as we get to the near point of being able to offer some type of ablation like microwave, or perhaps do a direct injection of pre-malignant lesions with immunologic agents, or even use very microscopic dissecting robotic instrumentation. These technologies will be able to be wheeled around from my room to the GI oncologist, to the urologist, to the interventional pulmonologist without any concern of mapping or issues with actually transporting the technology. Let me share with you during my journey some of the value that I found in this Monarch robotic platform. For the first time, I've actually been able to visualize peripheral nodules, peripheral tumors. And you can see in this image, sort of at the three to five o'clock um, time frame of the image on the right, you actually see the nodule. You can see your instruments going into this nodule. 
you know they are there. And more importantly, even having a centralized lesion with a so-called bronchial sign, and when I take my first pass, I see no irregularity of the mucosa of the bronchus, I can penetrate I can confirm with radial endobronchial ultrasound, I can assess my depth of penetration, and I can deliver a tremendous amount of biopsies, and then do real-time changes and move over to different quadrants of the mass of concern to improve my sampling yield. As thoracic surgeons in our database, the majority of lung cancers we see are in the upper lobe. That pretty much parallels in my program. And again, those are the most challenging lesions to get at, the apical and the medial apical. With the sheath and the camera, you have a theoretical 310 degrees of articulation. It allows you to make turns and put you into positions that give you access to all these nodules of concern without any evidence of deviation. I deploy fiducials with this. Speak with your radiation oncologist. It really depends on the platform they use. All my red onks use a LINAC base. They're happy with one fiducial. Folks that use a CyberKnife platform prefer, prefer three to four fiducials. But when I have a patient like this, extremely high risk, or we're very concerned it's a lung cancer, and we, we've staged them to a presumed early stage, and I know they're just not going to be a surgical resective patient. At the same time, when I'm doing the biopsy, I'll deploy a fiducial. And with the working channel, you can relatively use any type of fiducial you're comfortable with or you've had experience with. For me, I've used Cobra fiducials my entire career. They work well for me. One of the um, issues that we're finding more and more of is the request to go after these minute nodules and at-risk individuals in ground glass opacification. So let me just digress here. Medical oncologist calls you because, well, I've got a patient on therapy for an advanced malignancy, and they've had four millimeter nodules that have now become seven millimeters, and we don't think we can get them by transthoracic biopsy. And even at that small size, I'm a little leery about trying to uh, render a very high accurate diagnosis, even with any EMB or robotic platform. But with these patients, we can inject at the same surgical setting. I prefer to use ICG. Some people use a combination of ICG and methylene blue or methylene blue. Others have also even implanted uh, little fiducials to help um, further assist pathology in, in seeing these nodules of concern. And we can do the same thing with ground glass opacifications that have increased in size or developed a nodular component. So now, in sort of a one-stop shop, we can bring the patient into the operating room, perform the robotic bronchoscopy, mark the targets of concern, reposition the patient. I favor utilizing a robotic uh, da Vinci platform, but others may choose to use VATS, and they may do so. But the beauty of this is we're able to address this and intervene immediately with a very short um, length of stay. And, and why do I sort of uh, raise concern over this is because all these patients are now undergoing lung cancer screening with low dose non contrast chest CTs. And what we've identified now is there's a 63% incidence of GGOs. I believe GGOs are going to become a diagnostic dilemma because they're very difficult in architecture to biopsy. They're routinely falsely negative. And really, one way of sort of making a diagnosis and therapeutically intervening is with this combined one-stop double robot surgical approach. Now, I've been at this new program as a director for about two years, and historically, we have not had rows. We are, we are just starting to do rows. And, and even our rows is not what we wish it to be. We actually have to get specimens and run them two and a half minutes away to a pathology office to be looked at. But one of the issues I've used to compensate for that is by getting a tremendous amount of tissue. So when you have a patient that is concerning, that is at risk, and you can actually, you see the nodule at the 11 o'clock uh, location, you confirm its location. In the upper right, hand, you take multiple biopsies in different quadrants. You generate 26 forcep biopsies. And all this tissue that you've sent, your pathologist comes back 
inflammatory, fibrotic, uh, no malignant cells. This is an accurate diagnosis, and I'm very comfortable in following these patients over the course with radiographic surveillance because I've delivered a ton of tissue to them. It lets you think out of the box. Because I have continuous visualization all the way to the perimetry, um, I actually thought about a patient that I had as an unfortunate young lady who accidentally was holding a brad nail in her mouth while reaching up to hang a picture. And she aspirated this, and it was deep in the right lower lobe. And, you know, historically, you're not going to remove this through any traditional bronchoscopic or rigid bronch component. In the, in the literature, people have talked about trying to put catheters in, balloon catheters, and fish things, these things out. But most likely, this requires a surgical intervention. So I said, I have an option for you. And I actually created a targeting sequence utilizing the Monarch planning system as though this was a nodule. And we found this to be in the sixth bronchial division. And actually, I was able to pass the robot right on to target. And I grabbed the largest uh, gra um, biopsy forceps I had. And three times, I tried to pull this thing out. But the head was so deeply embedded, it would slingshot further. But with the scope, I was able to continue to chase this down and then eventually put a wire snare around it. And with the fine motor control, be able to move this to the head of the nail, manipulate the nail in the right lower lobe, pull it out, and this lady went home. So, you know, this may be the first reported true intervention, but it just gives you an idea of the continuous total control you have by both navigational, optical, and fine motor control without any user fatigue whatsoever. This is my favorite slide. Again, sort of a centralized mid parenchymal large mass. You have your bronchial sign, you pass your scope in there, and the bronchus is pristine. There are no tumor cells there. This would be one that, as we did under an NB platform, we would biopsy and biopsy and biopsy, and most likely I'd get a return of benign bronchial mucosa or non diagnosis. But when I see this, I can make my penetration, and I just use the Wang needle to penetrate into that area. I can put my radial endobronchial ultrasound. I can confirm where I'm at in my target, assess my depth of penetration, be able to take biopsies proximally mid distal in the lesion, and then with fine motor control and continuous direct vision, reposition this to another quadrant. We confirm it with radial levis, take more biopsies. This is the first time that I've been able to really have a solid grasp of being able to go in there and deliver with a relatively high accuracy some kind of diagnosis utilizing this platform. For almost a decade, I viewed electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy as sort of a commercial jet. You've got robust electromagnetic navigation. These computer screens tell you where you are, where you're going, when you come on target. So when this came up, we thought, well, why can't we get the same kind of accuracy levels as our interventional radiologists do? And what I could share with you is 100% of the time, I could take this jet and leave planet Earth. 96% of the time, I could bring this jet back and land somewhere on Earth. But to actually put this jet on the correct runway, I was in anywhere between 60 and 85%, and that's pretty much par with the literature for standard EMV. This is how I view monarch robotic bronchoscopy. I now have use of senses that I haven't had for almost a decade. The visual acuity, in addition to the optical recognition that partners with the navigational guidance to give you continued registration to give you a higher level of accuracy. I just want to digress and put on my administration hat and just share with you how we utilize the technology to sort of fit our mission and vision in the redevelopment of our lung cancer program in our cancer institute. I uh, was recruited here two years ago, but when I looked at some older data, and we're sort of situated in it's called Southwest South Florida, and there I am in Sarasota, Florida, and in 2016, I was quite surprised to learn that our lung cancer primary market share was only 40%. Now, when you run a lung cancer program, 
you need to control at least 85% of your primary market to really you know, do the best that you can. There's always going to be 15% of people that want to go to X university or Y university or this cancer center because they saw the advertisement on TV. And that's fine. You're not going to change that. But what I found was in our region, our patients were traveling an hour and a half away to go to two very robust cancer programs who for decades did a great job networking and marketing and developing relationships. But what also surprised me, I had a tremendous population just north of me, but a very large population just south of me. And the population south of me was actually driving around three hours to go up to Tampa, where they were all being referred. And when we looked at some of these specific numbers, as these patients were being sent for just for lung biopsies, most of these biopsies were being done by CT image guided. Very few biopsies were actually being done by an EMD platform. This is a very busy sign. But my takeaway from this sign, and you can look at this in your own marketplaces, the more lung biopsies you do, the more control you're going to have of your lung cancer therapy. And on the far left side, our region had a notable incidence of lung nodules per year. This was 2017 data. And this was just sort of all comers that showed up with the diagnosis of R91.1. But what we were very surprised, and first thing I did is I spoke with some of my interventional radiology doctors, and they said, oh, no, no, we're busy. We're biopsying every nodule in Sarasota. And I said, you know, in reality, you're, you're biopsying about 160 nodules that year. And only a few of these were done by EMB in, in sort of the mid-20 range. But what surprised me is the majority of these nodules went up to Tampa. And even in Tampa, most of these nodules were being performed by transthoracic needle biopsy. So it gave me a chance to establish some collaborations. In my primary market, I have 15 pulmonologists. I have one very talented interventional pulmonologist. So together, we designed a program. And we went out and we educated everybody. And we started the education in 2018 when I came here just from EMB. And we, we doubled our program. And the numbers were, were still low. I believe we're a program that should be able to deliver 400 uh, uh, EMB or, or robotic bronchoscopic procedures per year. But in the nine months of this year, as we are escalating, and we are still on the beginning of our growth curve, We've already biopsied 116 patients during that time frame. That's 132% nine-month annualized growth as compared to last year. In the same time, we've really ramped up our lung nodule screening program, and we are growing in a very robust fashion, and we are educating each of our clients to come in for lung cancer screening that we also can aid in their diagnostic opportunities with this monarch technology that we had. You know, we then continued generating awareness and we, we partnered with our marketing, with our administrative team, and we, we sponsored very nice dinners. And before we even launched the program, we invited 50 of our primary car, um, market specialists, medical oncology, radiation oncology, pulmonary medicine. And I had about 40 of those physicians show up. And we presented uh, three lectures with, at that point, a national authority who came down and spoke on the technology. And we got great feedback suggesting we should go forward. Of course, we've uh, up, upgraded all our web uh, presence. We've had some flyers that were sent to certain zip codes. And we continue to do public as well as staff, as well as referring physician awareness, which is a continuous process for me. We utilized our social media. And this social media really had a lot of views. We would put this up on our hospital Facebook, on our personal Facebook, and this got people talking. Our healthcare system has 6,000 employees. We've educated all of them on this, and they start talking about the abilities of our program. So these are very simple things to do to try to get the awareness out. We did a very novel thing, which I was quite impressed. My colleague Joe Seaman and I dedicated two hours of our time. We actually set up the robot in the lobby of our hospital. 
uh, Oris provided the working model. We had some interventional tools and we, we sat there. And our goal was just to sort of educate staff, educate hospital people as, and um, our customers, our patients as they happen to walk by the lobby. Uh, marketing went out and they invited media. We actually had five different networks from our primary, our secondary, our tertiary market come out. They interviewed both Dr. Seaman and myself, and suddenly that evening, we are all over our primary, secondary, and tertiary market sharing our, our robot. Well, our local affiliate ABC actually took this national, and I first found out about this when my wife's friend in Los Angeles said, you know, I see your husband on ABC News every night for five days straight. And what we were really surprised once we got the analysis back is we captured an audience of almost 900,000 patients in 17 states. We completely covered our state of Florida. Most of these views were television. And it's really the population that we're dealing with, a slightly older population, somewhere online. But at the end of the day, if we were to pay for this, this would have been almost $98,000 of marketing. We didn't pay a dollar for this. My colleague and I invested two hours of our time and were able to get wonderful uh, media coverage and further patient education. I'm conducting a financial review right now. You know, one of the challenges when I had to have this conversation with my C-suite was there is a cost with every technology. Why should we invest in the cost? And is the cost a little bit higher that this is going to take me a long time to recoup the cost? What is the added value? Now, there's some Medicare-based data, and what you have to uh, converse with your C-suite about is in 2019, there was a dramatic change in the reimbursement of any type of navigational biopsy with concurrent mediastinal staging, EBUS. There was an increase of just almost 120% reimbursement. So I'm actually conducting a study, and part of my study is I want to analyze the direct labor, the supplies, all other direct costs. Now, this is early data. This is a very small end value. But what it did is allow me to capture a range of reimbursement. This is our revenue stream. So when we do the robotic bronchoscopy and biopsy, the hospital receives a mean re, uh, revenue stream of $4,500. We've had a range up to $15,000 with some insurances. When we combine it, that range is about $5,300 and change. So one of the questions I get asked is, well, how long is it going to take you to pay this thing off? We know what we paid for the investment on the technology. And when I ran ratios for the nine months of data that I control, of the diagnoses only, so I'm, I'm not including putting in a fiducial, I'm not including putting in ICG, but when we're doing a diagnosis only, we did that about 68% of the time. 32% of the time, we actually did the robotic bronch for biopsy, and we did a concurrent real-time mediastinal staging with endobronchial ultrasound. Now, part of the, most of these numbers actually occurred in sort of the latter four months of our experience, because early on, we're going through our um, experience. We're getting through our, our learning curve on this. We're concentrating on doing the best we can. And then as we become more time efficient, we started tagging on the EBISes. So if I was to really look at the last two months, we're probably actually going to get to the point of 50-50, if not get more to the point of robotic bronchoscopy and EBIS. And the value is when you have a patient that's referred to you and has at risk, instead of sending them for a transthoracic needle biopsy and then have to do a second intervention for endobronchial ultrasound or mediastinoscopy, whatever you favor to do, um, we can actually do robotic bronchonevus in one setting. So when I looked at these numbers at nine months, I created a net revenue of over $500,000 for the hospital. And even from the get-go, we have a positive contribution margin in this program to our institution which normally is not the case with standard EMB. So look at this, start talking to your CFO, 
look at your own uh, values. We have a robust decision support program that works with me, and I, I hope to be able to generate a white paper on this. And I share this with you because this is a study in evolution with preliminary data. I view this entire process for our lung cancer program as a pyramid, and I actually favor putting the monarch robot at the tip of this pyramid because I think there is a significant downstream revenue enhancement by controlling those biopsies, making the diagnosis, and then funneling that to your local medical radiation oncologist, your thoracic surgical oncologist, the additional stratification studies or follow-up studies that these patients will be. So for us, in our mission and our vision at our Cancer Institute for a newly developing lung cancer program, the Monarch has really fit in perfectly. Again, we are in the beginning of our growth curve. I can only foresee this getting busier and better and more efficient and more robust. As I've said before, I believe this technology in comparison to my experience with another EMB platform is a game changer. There's no user fatigue. There's no catheter deformation. You can see at times these nodules or tumors under direct vision. You can biopsy them directly. You might not even need fluoroscopy at that point. But more importantly, you can see when that nodule is lurking behind an airway and you've got to penetrate the airway. I'm just no longer seeing the benign bronchial mucosal non-diagnostic pathology report after I perform a lung biopsy. And I'm excited for the near future as we're going to be able to implement interventional changes, microwave ablation, fine controlled microinjection, other miniaturized robotic encounters for myself and my other surgical oncology colleagues. So I know there's been a tremendous amount of information here. I wanted to keep us within our time constraints. We could go over some questions. I'd be more than happy if you wish to individually reach out to me in the future. Boris can make that happen. But I wish all of you the best of luck on pursuing this technology, on growing your programs, and growing your lung cancer programs and your GGO programs because these are epidemic proportions. And there's going to be no shortage of making these diagnoses and intervening appropriately. Thank you very much for your attention. Your family. Um, this will conclude the webinar. And uh, if you have any other questions, please follow up directly with your ORIS representative uh, in your area. Thanks so much.